Right, so um, one of the major differences between the probability and likelihood is when you have a random variable, right, um, say x, um, it is common sense to ask, okay, what is the probability of x falling in a range, right? So again, in our uh, last example, if uh, I say that x is normally distributed, um, say, with the mean 3, right, and say, like, this is its mean, mu equals 3, and say the standard deviation of this uh, normal distribution is 1, right? And if I ask you what is the probability of x falling in a range, we said that um, this makes sense, right? It's just the area under the curve uh, between these two uh, endpoints, 1 and 5. Right. Now, I want to ask you something. Sometimes, it, the case is not that, okay, you have a random variable and you know the way it behaves because you know its, distri uh, its distributions. Um, you, uh, sometimes the case is you have some samples from that random variable. Right? It means that you're not totally blind about it. So you have some samples to give you a hint as to what type of distribution could have described that random variable in the first place. Right? So let's say, um, let's say you have this, um, how to plot it, okay. Let's say this is your x, right? And let's say you have some samples. You have loads of data, point, uh, data points around here, and you've got less concentration here, and then as you go further, they become less and less apparent, and eventually nothing on the other two sides, right? Now, here's the thing, my friends. Um, if we assume a distribution, say a normal distribution, right? Any distribution has a set of parameters. A normal distribution, for instance, n, is always shown by its mean and its variance, right? So these are the parameters of that distribution, right? Now, I tell you that a normal distribution can very nicely describe x, right? Now, what, how can that be helpful to you? I can tell you more or less it doesn't help you at all, more or less. You can get somewhere from that, but at, at, at first it doesn't tell you much. Now, I want to ask you something. If I told you that a normal distribution describes x and you tell me, okay, well, ah, I'm going to come up with a normal distribution, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that, okay, this is the normal distribution that you're talking about. And then I say, wait a minute. Yeah, it's, well, it's a very ugly normal distribution, but anyways, it is, a, it has that bell-shaped thing going on there. But then I say, look, my samples are concentrated around here, but your normal distribution is over here, meaning that, uh, the n, say, n uh, hat that you're proposing has, say, say this guy is 10 over here. Let's say the mean is 10 and and uh, the standard deviation, say, it's very small, right? right? Because it's very ridiculous scenario. Say it's like 0 0.01, right? Now, if I if you tell me that, if, if you say that, okay, I believe that this is the normal distribution that uh, is basically describing x, then I would say, no, it's not, because I can see that the samples that I actually have are concentrated around, say, zero. Say this point right here is zero, right? How can I say that? How can I describe describe this mathematically as, how likely is that, given this distribution, how likely is that for me to observe these samples from this distribution, right? Now, 
if I want to put it in mathematical terms, I would say, what is the likelihood, and this is right here, likelihood of these parameters that you're proposing to me, meaning mu equals, say, 10, and variance equals 0.01, given my observations d. Basically, if I want to make it a more general term than this, I would say, what is the likelihood of, pay attention, my parameters theta, we usually show that, show the parameters of, your, of the model with theta. Okay, so get used to this. This is going to come up later on a lot. So what is the likelihood of the theta, the parameters of your, of, uh, your model, given the observations that you have, in this case, these dot, uh, red dot points that you have, right? So how likely is that these parameters are describing your observations? How likely are these parameters to be true, right? Now, how can I mathematically uh, compute that? You remember, we talked about this weird number over here, this 0.5. And you remember how did we compute that? We actually plugged in a particular value, in this case, say zero, it can be any value, and just computed uh, the outcome. It's just a plug and uh, compute thing, right? So you just put in the value of each and individual of your samples into this function, it is a function, uh, into this p of x, and you compute the outcome, right? And we said that that's the likelihood, right? So if I do that, it means that say like this guy right here, this little guy right here, this would, if I plug it in into this normal distributions uh, ma uh, like formula, this would give me a very low number, right? Say it would give me uh, L1. Say this point right here would give me L2. This point right here, this point right here, this point right here. So as I get closer to my proposed Gaussian, my likelihoods get larger and larger. Why? Because say this point, say, say we have, for instance, a red point over here, right? If I plug it into the formula, it will touch my Gaussian somewhere around here. And if I want to measure, measure it, like what value is that on my vertical uh, axis, which is again the P of X, I would get a value. And this guy right here is the likelihood. So the closer, cl the closer I get to the center of my, uh, of my Gaussian, the higher and higher the, uh, the likelihood would be. So this is basically a growing trend as I get closer, right? Now, here's my question. Let me uh, make it a little bit cleaner. Uh, uh, let me clean the scene a little bit. Now, let's assume that I have three samples from my X, which is a continuous random variable, right? There's this, uh, say, expression, say, terminology that uh, in statistics that we say that, okay, X is a random variable, but it's, uh, it is a, uh, these, the samples that you get from it are IID, basically an IID random variable, independent and identically distributed. I don't want to go deeper into IID, the definition, but the, the moral of the story that we're going to get from here is that if these samples x1, x2, and x3 are independent of each other, right, then if I have the likelihood of each one of them, meaning that, okay, x1 has uh, the, the likelihood of 1, remember, I just plug it into the formula and I get the value, this one has the L2, and say, uh, x3 has L3 likelihood, right? 
Now, if I ask you that, okay, what is the uh, likelihood? Well, let me switch to white. If I ask you, what is the likelihood of your current parameters, theta, meaning the center and the variance of your normal distribution, whatever it is, given your samples? What are your samples? X1, X2, and X3. So this is the question. Remember, likelihood means what is I mean, how likely is that these theta are describing your samples, right? Now, you have L1, you have L2, and you have L3, right? How, do you, uh, how did you compute that again? You basically said, uh, so b b before I jump into that, if I want to compute this likelihood is basically, um, you, you're dealing with the probability of X1, x2 and x3 given the parameters so remember what we did exactly is exactly what we did is exactly what you're seeing here mathematically so we said that okay, how likely is that theta is describing your samples right it means that how well is this how, how good is this gaussian uh, basically how well is it describing your samples the way we did that was we just said, okay, let's assume that theta is true. If that's true, what is the probability of seeing x1, x2, and x3, right? And we just plugged each one of them in and we got L1, L2, and L3, which are the, basically the, out, uh, the outputs of your normal distribution function, right? In probabilities, uh, we have this theory that if you have, uh, say, just as a side note, let's say the theorem, Right? The probability of observing, say, your first random variable capital A, like getting the value small a, and your second random variable getting the value small b, if a and b are independent of each other, remember, I want to connect to this iid bits, right? Uh, identical and independence, right? I want to talk about this in the independent part. So if A and B are independent, right? It means that you can have, you compute this as a, as, as a basically the multiplication of the probability of A equals small a multiplied by the probability of B equals small b, right? So compute this separately compute this separately multiply them and then that will tell you about the probability the joint probability of observing a and b at the same time right like capital a is a random variable capital b is a random variable what is the probability of capital a getting having the value of small a and capital b getting the value of small b at the same time if they are independent you can just calculate the first and second probability separately and then multiply them together because they're independent. That is a theory in probability. Let's just agree that that's, uh, let's just accept that that's true. I'm, I don't want to dig too much into the math, but if we have that, if we uh, uh, you want to use that here, we have the probability of x1, x2, and x3 given the theta, right? So we, knew, we know that if x1, x2, and x3 are actually in independent of each other. You can say that, okay, this whole thing equals the probability of x1 given theta multiplied by the probability of x2 given theta multiplied by the probability of x3 given theta, right? And what does it mean? It means that let's assume that my normal distribution is actually what what uh, the one that has uh, basically generated these samples. Let's given theta means that let's assume that's the case. Now, what is the probability of observing x1? We just plugged in x1, and if you notice here, we just got l1 as an output, right? L1. For p for for the second one, the probability of x2, we got l2, and for uh, x3 we got uh, l3 we just multiply them together that will basically multiply their outcomes and get this this does not have to be between 0 and 1 
No, it can get higher than one. Right? It's because it's not actually a probability. Remember, when you look at this function, right, on the, on the left, I mean, when you, when you look at this Gaussian, it is interesting to know that like, one can be here, number one can be here, which cuts through your Gaussian, right? Yeah, we always say that, okay, the probability is always a value between zero and one, but likelihood doesn't have to be between zero and one. Remember, when I say the probability has to be between 0 and 1, it means that if I compute the area under this curve from minus infinity to plus infinity, I will get 1, exactly 1, if it's a probability distribution function, right? But it doesn't mean that if I take a particular value here and I plug it in for every little value on the horizontal axis, just on its own, if I plug them in, I will definitely get a value between 0 and 1. No, that is not the case. The area under the curve describes the probability. And when I say the probability of x1 and x2 and x3 uh, given theta, I just mean that, okay, you have this function, the PDF that you have. I want you to plug those samples in and get their outputs, right? So. If you multiply them together, you get a number. Now, now, if I want to make it a little bit more formal, say you have set of samples as capital X, and it ranges from small x1, x2, all the way to x of n, right? Now, please pay attention to my terminology. Believe me, this is very important. The likelihood of the parameters theta given your capital X. It means that if I have this set of samples, x1 all the way to S, towards xn, how likely is that your current theta is actually describing your samples, right? So in this picture, if you have your samples somewhere around here and they get less and less present as you get further away from the center of your Gaussian. This Gaussian is pretty good then, right? Because you see, uh, if you compute the likelihood of each one of this point, it means that you just connect it vertically to, these, uh, to this Gaussian, right? And this just take the value, the output of your function, you multiply them together, you would get a reasonably high value compared to the case where if your samples were actually sent, concentrated around here. Each one of them would have a very small output if you plug them in into your into this particular Gaussian, right? So this Gaussian does not describe well your samples if they were concentrated around here. So the likelihood of this, these set of parameters, like this mu, and this variance, the likelihood of these two guys describing your samples, if your samples were on the tail over here, is pretty low, right? But if your samples were somewhere around here in the center, the likelihood of this particular mu and this particular variance would be quite high, right? So. If I want to uh, describe this mathematically, so the likelihood of theta given your samples, so you have n samples, remember? So this is basically equivalent to saying that what is the probability of all your samples, capital X, given the theta? Let's, it means that consider this theta, consider this Gaussian, what is the probability of observing each and one of these X's? Now, Remember, your x's are i, i, d. They are identically distributed and they are independent of each other, right? So if they're independent, it means that you can write this, problem, this, this p of x given theta as a multiplication, this capital pi, a probability of 
x of i given your theta where i goes from 1 to n right it means plug in x1 into your formula get the output multiply by plug in x2 get the output multiply by all the way to xn now this my friends is the likelihood of theta describing your sample set very well that this is this is very good now so this is the, the whole idea behind likelihood right now um, again as a reminder error that we talked about is equal to minus log of the likelihood right now we said that if we plug in uh, the input and the output the ground truth we come up with this final formula right here right this guy right here the probability of target value given the input and weight multiplied by the probability of the input right so let's remember this and keep going from here so basically we said that it's common practice to take the log from both sides and multiply everything by minus one right now uh, just as a reminder I'm gonna I'm gonna write it down again here so we said that the minus log of your posterior which is the probability of your model which we said that we're gonna denote as the weights in your neural network given your observations so this was basically the posterior how much you believe in your model given your observation uh, and you said that it equals to minus log of the likelihood observation given weights minus log of the prior of your model which is your w plus the log of the prior of your evidence the probability of you observing this particular uh, observation without considering the model or anything right now we talked about what what the likelihood uh, how it can be represented through the labels right so um, as a reminder I'm gonna just write it here as well right so this is what we got before right and you notice that we have this index I here right so this is for every input and ground truth separately right now let's assume that we have just more than one we have loads of examples that we have like we have loads of pairs of input and the ground truth like d1 t1 d2 t2 d3 t3 right if we assume that these pairs are independent of each other and we say that okay what is the probability of seeing all these pairs given your w given your model right if they are independent of each other then according to what we talked about previously this can turn into a multiplication now if I want to write the right hand let's forget about the left hand just to save some space so the likelihood would be minus so minus log of but remember likelihood for each one of those pairs we can compute this with this index i right but we have loads of independent pairs here in our data set in our sample set whatever you name it so that would be the multiplication of probability of observing each one of those pairs right so then we have here a write it as pi i goes from one to say capital n and then inside of that we have the probability of ti given input and the weights of your model multiplied by the probability of your observation and the rest remains the same minus log of your probability of the weights plus the log of the probability of observing uh, those uh, th those pairs of data those pairs of samples right now if you notice 
we have the log of some multiplications, right? So I can turn it into a sigma, right? We talked about this rule before. So this would be minus, so this log would be distributed among all these pairs. So this would be minus sigma of i from, uh, i uh, goes from one to n of log of this whole thing again, right? Again, minus log of probability of w plus log of probability of d. Lovely. Um, okay, let's just write it just to be consistent in, in everything. All right, probability of di, right. Now, please pay attention that here, right here, we have a multiplication, right? So log of, say, probability of T1 given D1 and W multiplied, multiplied by probability of D1 plus log of T2, D2, W, D2 plus, it goes all the way, right? But my point is that this multiplication, again, we're gonna use, so if we have log of A multiplied by B, this can be written as log of A plus log of B, right? So let's distribute this whole thing and make it a little bit uh, simpler. So uh, basically that pi uh, turned into a sigma and now the sigma uh, will be distributed and the log will be distributed and uh, the first and second term here that you saw that have been multiplied will get separated between two terms, meaning that uh, we had this bit first, so minus sigma of, so i goes from one to n, sigma of log of the first term, probability of ti given di and w, okay? Pay attention to this part, minus sigma of i equals 1 to n, log of the probability of di, which is the second term that you have there, right? So they got separated from each other. Again, uh, the right hand would be the same. Again, you would have minus log of prob of w, uh, plus the log of the probability of observing those pairs of data. Lovely. Now that we've seen how, uh, how we can simplify this, let's uh, talk about the optimization uh, part. Now, uh, the important thing here is that not all of these terms actually depend on the parameters of your model, right? So you basically want to optimize your model, meaning that you want to find the best set of parameters that uh, result in the minimum error, right? So there are two terms of all these four terms that do not depend on the, the parameters of your model. Namely, uh, it's this part over here and the probability of uh, the whole set of samples. These two bits do not depend on the parameters of your models and during optimization, you do not need to consider either of them, right? So just to make it easier again, like uh, in a nutshell, your error now equals to minus sum of log the probability of t of i given d of i and the parameters of your model minus log of your priors, uh, basically your, uh, your model priors. And again, i goes from one to n, because remember, uh, your sample set has n pairs. Each pair consists of D of i and T of i, basically your input and the corresponding ground truth for that input, 
So if input is an image, the output would be the, output would be the corresponding uh, class label. Say class zero is cat, class one is boat, class three is uh, sky, whatever. Okay. So this is what. So this right here is very important. So this is like after all the pain and suffering that we went through, this is what we get. Okay. Now you can use this in any uh, supervised algorithm that, that you come up with in the future. Now, <clears throat> there are a couple of um, notes that I have to make here before we jump into the next step. Um, actually, not a couple of, couple of notes, but uh, something, very, uh, uh, something very small. Um, and it's this prior bit over here, right? Um, the probability of your, uh, uh, of your model Hmm. So, in practice, uh, they don't really focus on the prior. As I said before in, in the previous videos, the probability of your, uh, of your model, uh, it's, kind of, it's, it's been kind of criticized in the literature to use them in your model um, because, well, the more evidence you get, the more and more you'll be uh, confident. Uh, I mean, you, 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 the more and more you'll be confident in your model, whether it's a good model or not. Um, so sometimes, uh, basically, they just uh, ignore it. Um, or there are cases where you can actually consider it. I mean, do not like leave it leave it out. Like for instance, it's a probability, right? It's a probability of your model. You can consider, say, a, a certain distribution, say, um, a Gaussian distribution, right? So basically, you can say that okay, my uh, the weights of my model. If I just uh, like. Uh, consider a distribution for it and if I say that it's a, a normal distribution then it means that it can be described as the famous uh, normal distribution that we've always seen so here instead of x you have your w's w minus uh, the mu of the distribution squared to multiply by the and um, by the variance of the distribution right and if, if, if I take the log of this whole expression uh, I don't want to jump into details, but that log will cancel out the exponentiation here. And eventually you will come up with a formula that is proportional to the square root of your W. Actually, loads of sums of them. Basically, uh, what you get would be like W1 squared, W2 squared, all of them summed uh, on each other, right? Summed with each other. So you've got loads of sums. Uh, of the square of your uh, of your of the weights of your models so basically something uh, in the order of w1 squared plus w2 squared all the way to to w like whatever the number of families capital M squared this is called the L2 norm of a random variable they show usually with these notation right so you have your uh, basically your error, the, the sum uh, of the likelihood, the log of likelihoods, minus that. So, and then you would add uh, this L2 norm. It, it is not the exact term that you would end up with, but something proportional to this onto your model. It means that it, it, it is a regularizing factor, right? I, I don't want to jump into regularizers here, but I just opened this little bit um, this, uh, th th this part a little bit just to introduce the idea of you can actually add regularizers to your error function it means that maximum the likelihood no, sorry maximize the likelihood of observing these values t while making sure that I'm regularizing the sum of my weights it means that I, I want to I, uh, I, I want to keep the weights of my model as small as possible and yet get the highest likelihood which means that I'm gonna get the lowest error okay again in our discussion and this uh, in this course uh, I'm we, we're going to basically ignore uh, the, the basically the priors so we're gonna ignore that and basically just focus on the likelihood bit so the final uh, formula that we will end up with, I'm going to probably write it in a colorful, uh, in a colorful font. 
So the error, the, the general thing that you see in the literature would be just the likelihood bit that we ended up with. So the sigma of log of the likelihood, probability of target value given input value and the weight of your model, where i goes from 1 to n. And this, my friends, is the whole story, the way uh, error functions will be born from this point on. Uh, after, so in, 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 the, in the next uh, session, we will talk about this likelihood more and more. Like, probably most of you are kind of confused in terms of what does it even mean to say the probability of the ground truth given the input and the parameter of your model? What does it even mean? Okay, in, in the next uh, class, we will consider a particular case, uh, actually a very practical case, where we want to, s we want to solve the problem of regression, right? Regression. And that is when uh, the sample set that we have consists of uh, certain inputs, meaning like say D1 and T, uh, D1 and T1, and then D2 and T2 all the way, right? So what does it mean? It's a regression, isn't it? So it means that I have some inputs, say this is my input, and I'm gonna show the D, and this is my target, the ground truth, right? So for every input, I have a ground truth. So this is the point. For this input, I have this ground truth. For this input, I have this ground truth. So say this is the perfect line that would uh, pass through my data points. So in regression, we want to find this perfect line if it's linear. Otherwise, it would be a nonlinear regression. Anyways, my point is, from next video on, we will jump into practical examples. So you will exactly see when we are trying to find a, for instance, a deal with a regression problem. What does this whole thing even mean? The target value, input value, the weights, what does it even mean? And what does it mean when we say that we want to minimize the error or maximize the likelihood? What does it really mean? We will focus on all of them, okay? So I know that this was a long video, but um, I, I wanted to just basically dissect everything and show you exactly how, uh, how people get into those uh, error functions. Why, does it, why is it so important? It's because uh, if you want in the future to come up with your own error function, depending on the application that you're dealing with, if you know the foundations well, you can do it. So from next video, we will get into practice, right? So on behalf of ML Don, Take care of yourself and see you in, in the next class. Bye-bye.